intanto Deborah sta arrivando e la introduco brevemente. Deborah James è direttrice del programma internazionale per il Centro di Ricerca Economica e Politica e fa parte del Consiglio di Amministrazione di Global Exchange. In precedenza è stata direttrice del programma dell'Organizzazione Mondiale del Commercio al Public Citizen Global Trade Watch. Ecco, Deborah, welcome. Eh, tutti hanno menzionato il, i Free Trade Agreement, gli accordi libero scambio. Ecco, adesso finalmente abbiamo lo spazio per parlarne in modo più, più approfondito insieme ovviamente al tema degli investimenti e della governance e degli investimenti globali. Prego Deborah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll be speaking in English. Thank you all for being here and for the organizers for this wonderful event and for inviting me here along with Our World is Not for Sale, a global network working today against the World Trade Organization. Today I want to address the issue of the way corporations control our food system through the policies that are set in binding trade agreements. These agreements matter because they set the rules under which production, distribution, and consumption of food occurs. Because they are written by corporations, these agreements are always tilted in corporate interests. And because they are binding internationally, they are enforceable under international law. I want to talk about the agreements we must oppose, that we still have a chance of stopping from ever existing. And I want to talk about the ones that already exist and what we can do to change them. Let's start with a little bit of background about the trade agreements. There are various ways that governments protect farmers and domestic production from foreign competition. We generally think of these as either supporting or subsidizing domestic farmers on one hand, or helping shield domestic production, on the other hand, from competition by making foreign imports more expensive, by imposing tariffs. And it's important to remember that tariffs are just taxes on trade. They're paid by foreign corporations to the country in which it wants to profit. In their periods of development, most rich countries protected their domestic farmers through both subsidies and tariffs. As they grew more competitive and had comparative advantage in manufactured goods, many decided that it was a good idea to reduce those supports because their companies and products could become competitive without them. However, <coughs> rich countries were, generally speaking, not competitive in agriculture. Though technological innovations reduced the labor required to produce the same amount of food, producers in the US, for example, still depend on subsidies from the US government to be competitive internationally, just as producers in Europe depend on tariffs to keep foreign products out and domestic products competitive. There's nothing wrong with subsidies. What matters is who benefits from them, from the government subsidies. That is why the US and Europe have never allowed global free trade in agriculture. Since they started global free trade agreements in 1947, they did not allow agriculture to be part of the global free trade regime. Until developing countries finally forced them to include it in the 1990s as part of the agreements that became the World Trade Organization, or WTO, founded in 1995. At the same time, developing countries were made by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank to liberalize their agriculture production. This involved further reducing or abolishing supports, such as, for example, public procurement systems, food reserve management, group sharing of technology and machinery, marketing boards, subsidies for infrastructure, research for new crops, and commodity conventions. At the same time, developing countries were made to reduce or abolish tariffs on imports. The idea sold to them was that if they were to produce cash crops for export, in which they would specialize instead of growing food, they could sell those cash crops in the market and buy food cheaper in the global markets. Except that the markets aren't open. Developed countries still maintain vast subsidy schemes for agriculture producers that usually benefit the largest corporate producers 
and still have tariffs on many of the products from developing countries. At the same time, there's also been an incredible consolidation of the production and distribution industries in global food trade. Corporations like Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta have developed patented seeds, which I think you've heard about in this uh, forum. They own about half of the global seed markets. They use extremely exploitative labor in the harvesting of the produce, particularly in the United States. They often subcontract the actual labor of production so that they never have to treat a worker as an employee and so that they can get access to land in areas where land is or was controlled locally. Corporations such as Walmart have consolidated the wholesale and retail distribution of food so that they control prices in the market. Food processing corporations like Nestle and Unilever have integrated what's called global value chains in agriculture, while food service companies like McDonald's are getting involved in contract farming, squeezing the farmers even more. And it's not just northern-based corporations, unfortunately. Companies based in countries like Saudi Arabia, China, Singapore, and Brazil are also very active in this. Financialization of the agriculture commodities markets has also meant that the middlemen like Cargill can squeeze the farmers even more. When the prices go down, the farmers lose. But when the prices go up, the middlemen take the profit. Now corporations, <coughs> through the governments that represent them, have been working to lock in these policies through trade agreements. In the WTO, we now have 20 years of experience with rules that were written originally by US-based corporations, which allow them to keep receiving even trade distorting subsidies from the US government in the tens of billions of dollars annually, while developing countries are not allowed this same right. They were not allowed by the IMF to subsidize in the past, and so the WTO does not allow them to do so now. Now a new crop of free trade agreements <coughs> would make the situation worse. Supposed free trade agreements, or FTAs, are not really about free trade because they impose a very extensive set of deregulation and liberalization rules, including very protectionist policies on intellectual property for patent monopolies, including monopolies on seeds and copyrights that are far greater than any protection currently offered for farmers. The only freedom these agreements represent is freedom for transnational capital to exploit workers and the environment in the search of more profit. In fact, these agreements are a great threat to human freedom, so we should call them corporate trade agreements, not free trade agreements. And whether it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, among the elites of 12 countries of the Pacific region, or the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP, between the European Commission and the US government, or any other bilateral or regional so-called FTA, we must oppose them and we must win. Yes, I hope so, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> After one of the first so-called new generation of these agreements went into effect, NAFTA, between the US, Mexico, and Canada, Mexico, as we know well, the global birthplace of maize, of corn, became flooded with cheap, mechanized, subsidized imports of corn. Mexico changed its constitution to allow foreign ownership of land. Genetically modified corn, GMO corn, flooded into the historic birthplace of corn in a land of genetic diversity. And the result was that over two million Mexican peasants eventually lost their land unable to compete to grow their own staple food that every man, Mexican man, woman, and child eats two to three times a day, the corn tortilla. This is the legacy of multinational dominated corporate trade. Now the so-called economic partnership agreements between the EU and Africa will likely have a similar impact there. They force Africans to reduce their protective tariffs on agriculture and they are a major threat to African food security. Now most of the African governments have already initialed 
Economic Partnership Agreements, EPAs, with the European Union. They have not been implemented yet, but they have been initialed and are on their way to being signed. Right now, there are millions of Europeans opposed to the TTIP between the EU and the US because they don't want chlorinated chicken <laughs> and they don't want genetically modified food and other low food safety standards. And that is wonderful and it is really important and we should support that. But there are far less Europeans working to stop the EPAs, which would devastate African farmers. And we need to build more solidarity with African farmers and unite to stop all the corporate trade agreements, whether it's TTIP, the TPP, the IPAs, or any other. We must work together, North and South, farmers and consumers, and stop them all. That's right. The other area, major, major area of battle is the World Trade Organization, the WTO. And we must remember that the only reason that developing countries agreed in 2001 to launch a new round of negotiations was with the mandate that it focus on changing the existing damaging rules on agriculture. But the EU and the US and Australia, et cetera, only want more market access, more trade in goods and services. In the global network focused on working against the WTO, the Our World is Not For Sale, we have always worked against the conclusion of the Doha round, the expansion of the WTO. There is, however, a new scenario. <coughs> In the wake of the global food crisis, every international agriculture agency, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, and many governments around the world have started to realize that food is different that we don't need more liberalization of agriculture, but we do need a new approach to governing, a change to the rules on agricultural trade set 20 years ago at the height of neoliberalism, and we need a new paradigm to guarantee food security and the human right to food. Well, there's also a new scenario within the WTO. After a long pause since 2008, Things have been moving quite quickly again. There is now a core group of developing countries that is demanding that developing countries should also have the right to support their farmers to produce food to feed their own populations, which is now illegal under WTO rules. Their proposal is to allow one of the best practices in supporting farmers and ensuring the right to food, which is food reserves. These are public stockholding programs in which the state is responsible for ensuring farmers' livelihoods and promoting rural development through above market state purchasing while ensuring that the food is distributed in a public distribution system to guarantee the right to food of the poorest populations, many of whom are farmers or food workers <laughs> or both. Countries like India are at the vanguard of leading this effort in the WTO as a direct result of the massive campaign by civil society and farmers united in India of the right to food movement to make it a right under Indian law to have a public distribution. But there are many countries that have food reserve programs that are already in violation of WTO rules. Countries as diverse as Botswana, Cameroon, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, Nepal, Senegal, Tunisia, Zimbabwe, and even least developed countries, including Bangladesh, Malawi, Tanzania, and Zambia, as well as others, have public stockholding programs in line with the African Union commitment of Maputo and Malabo. Many more countries are looking to develop them. There are many civil society movements around the world demanding that the government implement a right to food. These programs are essential to achieving the proposed sustainable development goals, which mention investing in smallholder farmers as essential to poverty reduction over and over again. Developing countries are fighting for these changes to WTO rules to allow them to support their own domestic production for domestic consumption all through 2013. But the US blocked it out of hand. 
They wouldn't even let the negotiations continue. And finally, after so much pressure, the U.S. finally agreed to a temporary patch, a complicated system called a peace clause in the Bali Ministerial in 2013. But WTO members also agreed to find a permanent solution to food security by December 2015. And this December 2015, there is going to be a WTO ministerial meeting in Nairobi, Kenya. It will be the first WTO ministerial in Africa. And African farmers in Kenya, in the Kenyan Small Scale Farmers Forum, have invited us all to come to protest against the unfair rules of the WTO, which hurt poor farmers and further corporate control of our agriculture systems, and to stop the US from blocking again a permanent solution for food security in the global rules. We all share, I think, a similar political viewpoint, the same view against the further liberalization of agriculture, against the corporate takeover of our food supply. Most of us, I think, probably believe that it should be the CFS, the Committee on Food Security, not the WTO, where global agriculture trade should be regulated. But we cannot ignore the fact that the WTO exists. We cannot wish it away. Just like we cannot ignore the fact that our countries are negotiating further corporate FTAs. Now in this new scenario, we must stop these FTAs from ever existing, and we must also stop another bad decision from being taken at the WTO. We must stop the agribusiness corporations and the governments that represent them, like the US, from blocking a permanent solution to food security in the WTO. The WTO, of course, will never be compatible, truly, with food security, with food sovereignty because its mandate is increasing trade rather than ensuring food security or food sovereignty. But the WTO is unfortunately not getting out of agriculture anytime soon. In the meantime, in the new scenario, we must not leave the single best chance we have of changing the most damaging rule on the WTO on the table. We must stop the US and Australia and Canada from blocking a decision on food security in the WTO this December in Nairobi. We in the long run must change the global system to allow countries to support their own farmers and to ensure the right to food of their poor citizens and to have a new paradigm of global agricultural trade rules based on food sovereignty and not on free trade agreements. And at the same time, we must oppose the further corporate control of agriculture by opposing the TPP and opposing and stopping the TTIP and opposing and stopping the EPAs between the EU and Africa and any other manifestation of this corporate control of the rules of the global food trade. Let's take back control, not only of the production of our food on the local level from the multinationals, but of the rules that govern the international trade in agriculture from the corporations. I look forward to working with all of you to achieve this this year and in the future. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you, Deborah, per il tuo per il tuo intervento e per questo sguardo globale anche sulla moltitudine di accordi eh, in corso di negoziato, tanti ormai sono 15 anni che continuano a essere, a essere negoziati, continuano a essere una minaccia. Adesso abbiamo in teoria 10 minuti, direi non di più, visto che vedo facce stanche e affamate. E poi vi ricordo che prima di andare a mangiare dovete andare a farvi la foto col cartello laggiù, altrimenti non avrete il cibo. E, mh, però lascerei un attimo appunto a voi gli interventi eh, dal pubblico. Ce n'è già uno, vero? Un altro? Prego. Per ora io ne ho visti due. Rialzate un attimo le mani. Tre. Quattro. Buongiorno a tutti, sono Cristian Cabrera, e sono contadino italo-argentino. 
ho una piccola azienda multifunzionale e, e oggi sto qua per la campagna popolare per l'agricoltura contadina eh, di cui facciamo parte qua in Italia perché eh, abbiamo ascoltato attentamente questi giorni devo ringraziare anche a Giosuè e a tutti dell'organizzazione per questo spazio eh, purtroppo non, come ha detto Maria Noel ieri eh, non siamo tanti contadini qua ci vogliono tanti contadini qua oggi per fortuna io e Roberto Schelino che più tardi sicuramente potremo chi vuole eh, parlare più vicino delle cose che stiamo costruendo qua in Italia le associazioni eh, dei contadini chiedo scusa perché il mio italiano è il 50% argentino che non mi lascia parlarlo 100% bene ma eh, questa campagna popolare per l'agricoltura contadina è lo sforzo dei contadini italiani che, si sia, che ci siamo messi insieme dal nord nord fino al sud sud incluso anche le isole e stiamo Abbiamo scritto una legge, abbiamo scritto delle linee guide per una legge che riconosca l'agricoltura contadina, che riconosca i contadini. I contadini del mondo oggi, in questo momento, abbiamo le mani distrutte e le schiena curva, curva si dice, e di tanto stare alla terra a fare il cibo. E anche io sono produttore qua in Italia di di carciofo, è un, un, un frutto particolarmente culturalmente adatto a, a questa cultura contadina italiana, il, il paese più contadino che io ho mai visto, e eh, non perché sto qua, ma questo paese sta portando avanti i contadini di questo paese, perché non sono l'istituzione, siamo i contadini, questa è la particolarità della campagna popolare per l'agricoltura contadina, I, i contadini stiamo portando avanti noi stessi proposte di legge che dovremo arrivare a essere approvate, devono, devono diventare una, una, un regolamento, così l'Unione Europea apre gli occhi, perché non basta con una dichiarazione universale dei diritti contadini, non basta, dobbiamo ognuno di noi, qua ci siamo presenti di tanti paesi del mondo, dobbiamo creare campagne per l'agricoltura contadina in tutto il mondo. Io invito a voi eh, chiedo scusa il mio entusiasmo, no? troppo entusiasmo, eh, grazie, ma io invito a voi, incontriamoci, come ha detto il, il caro compagno prima che, chiede, che vuole fare una rete, incontriamoci, incontriamoci per rafforzare questi piccoli sforzi, eh, i contadini avevamo pregiudizio dell'Espo dei Popoli, lo avevamo, perché non siamo stati dall'inizio a costruire questo percorso. Ma oggi siamo qua, e quello è l'importante, che qua ci sono i contadini, anche se non sono presenti perché stanno producendo il 70% del cibo. Ma siamo presenti e vogliamo ringraziare a tutti voi. Grazie. Allora abbiamo, grazie, abbiamo due interventi, lui e poi l'intervento dal pubblico lì, e poi direi a questo punto chiudiamo perché si è fatto veramente tardi. Hola, ¿cómo están a todas y todos? Mi nombre es Nicolás, vengo desde Uruguay en representación de la Red Vida. Soy un obrero y militante sindical del Sindicato del Agua. La pregunta es sobre los tratados internacionales y sobre el nuevo tratado de acuerdos de servicios, el TISA que se está negociando por fuera de la OMC, su alcance y su visión política de este tema. Muchas gracias. Facciamo, raccogliamo l'ultimo intervento e poi lasciamo Deborah rispondere. Uh, moi j'avais une seule question. Uh, C'était de. Elle avait dit si uh, le prix uh, chute, le prix en perd, et quand le prix uh, augmente, on lui retire son profit. Je voulais qu'elle explique un peu ça. Deborah? Ok. Ok, facciamo quest'ultima domanda. Sì, buonasera. E qual è attualmente il paese che è riuscito 
a, a mh, evitare appunto l'applicazione dei trattati o i paesi, perché so che ci sono state delle esperienze, mi pare proprio in Uruguay, delle zone che eh, a, appunto a bloccare eh, l'applicazione dei trattati di libero scambio, quindi prenderlo come ecco, un esempio di modello virtuoso. Ok, adesso diamo a Deborah. Um, so I will start with a question from the comrade from Uruguay about the trade and services agreement. Um, this is another new agreement. Uh, it can often be referred to together with the TPP among the countries of the Pacific and the TTIP, which is between the EU and the US. It is an agreement, again, to take the offensive interest, the corporate interest of the developed countries out of the WTO in order to never be responsible to change the agriculture rules in the WTO. They're taking their interests out, and they have a group of about 50 countries. They're negotiating for the further liberalization and deregulation of both public and private services. Okay, you can find a lot more information about this trade agreement on the website of Our World Is Not For Sale. The website is ourworldisnotforsale.org. <laughs> And we have information there in English and uh, Spanish and French. I'm sorry, not that much in Italian. But uh, yesterday, WikiLeaks, we all know WikiLeaks, they released the largest group of documents on a secret trade negotiation ever. 17 documents on the proposed TISA negotiations were released yesterday. They include annexes, which means chapters, for the deregulation and privatization of telecommunications, air transport, maritime transport, immigration, uh, domestic regulation, electronic commerce, a whole bunch of other issues. And um, if you Google TISA, TISA, services, WikiLeaks, you'll get a whole bunch of articles, including one of the first articles in Italian that came out yesterday in L'Espresso on the issue. So this is something that we equally have to fight against. My organization, the network, that I work in, together with Public Services International, the Global Union Federation of Public Services Workers around the world is fighting this trade agreement. Uh, we are absolutely determined to win. We will not allow for the privatization and further deregulation of public and private services around the world. This is not the kind of world we want to live in where corporations set the rules about how much governments are allowed to regulate finance. We think that should be public <laughs> oversight. That's the role of government, is to discipline corporations. And this agreement is about having governments have the role to enforce the right of corporations to make profit. That is changing the role of the state from a, 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 an entity supposedly acting in the public interest, we obviously have to contest that, into an, a, an institution designed to enforce the right of profit of transnational corporations. So we are also extremely focused against the TISA, and I have to tip my hat to the comrade from Uruguay because the Uruguayan trade unions are leading the world right now in a life and death fight against the TISA. They are the one country that has a chance of getting out of this agreement. We have been supporting the Uruguayans in the PITSNSA and the other uh, organizations that have been fighting against it. And they are likely to win. And any support we can give to the Uruguayans in their fight against the TISA will have a big impact for the whole rest of the world. So thank you to Uruguay for leading the way on that. On the issue of the financialization and the prices, um, the financial intermediaries, this is uh, um, companies like Cargill, there's many others, hedge funds, you know, all kinds of financial intermediaries, they have a lot of ways of managing the commodities markets. So commodities markets used to be managed by commodities agreements, where there was sort of like the international coffee agreement you might remember from a long time ago. There was an agreement about a range of prices where there was a minimum floor price to make sure that farmers were compensated fairly and a maximum price. And if there was a uh, certain, like if the production went so low that the market was flooded and the prices went down, then producers agreed to hold back a little bit. This is what we have with oil production generally because you hear about it all the time. We used to have that for commodities like coffee. And in the time of Reagan, all of these were abolished and deregulated. And instead now we have these financial intermediaries that they 
uh, basically trade in derivatives on the futures prices of global commodities so that they actually act as intermediaries with the prices where if the prices go down, they already have a hedge to make sure that they get paid more. And if the prices go up, they're going to make sure to capture that and keep the price for the farmer low. So it's, it's a whole other way that corporations have captured the trade. Those companies don't actually trade in anything. And they don't actually add value to the global economy. They are bloodsuckers. They should be considered as vampires of the economic system because they do nothing to add to production. <laughs> they don't actually even trade. All they do is find ways to suck money out of the work that you do. And, and we really need to have a, a very, there are many uh, organizations active in disciplining, trying to develop disciplines on the financialization of commodities, um, and we should support their efforts. On the last, uh, the other question I, uh, that was a question about how to block the FTAs. Um, how many people here are from Latin America or Canada or the United States? Anybody here from Latin America, Canada, or the United States? You want to stand up? Let's see how many people are here from Latin America, Canada, or the United States. These are the people that stopped the FTAA from existing. There was a proposed agreement on a free trade area of the Americas. Okay, we did it before. Let's have a round of applause for stopping the free trade area of the Americas, okay? We did it. It was going to be 34 countries. All of the countries of the Western Hemisphere, except Cuba, were going to be a part of it, okay? That was a huge victory. Now, we did have a big defeat in its aftermath, which is then that the U.S. went and negotiated free trade, again, free trade agreement, corporate trade agreements with the countries of Central America, the Dominican Republic. And those agreements are actually worse for those countries than the FTAA would have been for those countries because they didn't have Brazil and Argentina and the strong countries as part of their help in their negotiating power vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want there to be just a few small, weak African countries that have these trade agreements. We have to stop all of them, okay? And the EU agreements with Central America and the, the other ones with, with Latin America as well, all of these agreements need to be stopped. Whatever we do now to stop them <coughs> will save us 20, 40 years from now from fighting against the terrible impacts of these agreements when we see how much the people of Central America are suffering under you know, the 20 years almost of, of, of NAFTA and, and Central America of, what is it, eight years or something of the Central America Free Trade Agreement. The impacts are devastating, and we need to stop these rules from getting worse at the same time that we're all working in our communities to build up the alternatives. We need to do them both. Different of us do different things at different times, but it's all the same strategy, stopping the bad ones and promoting the good ones. And we, if we don't stop the bad ones, we're not going to have the policy space to promote the alternative systems that we want to have. Grazie. Grazie Deborah. E grazie anche per questo messaggio positivo.